Section six of the Travels of Ibn Battuta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Travels of Ibn Battuta by Ibn Battuta. Translation by Samuel Lee. Chapter 14 The River Sind, Multan, Jarai, El Samira, a Hindu sect, Sevastin, Natural Productions, Description of Couriers, Lahari, Bakar, Uja, The Bow, a Measure of Strength, Abuhar, Natural Productions of Hindustan, Passes a Desert Infested by Hindu Robbers, Ajudahan, the custom of burning widows, drowning in the Ganges, Sarsati, Masud Abad, Delhi, description of. The river just mentioned is the Sindhi. It is the greatest river in the world, and overflows during the hot weather, just as the Nile does, and at this time they sow the lands. Here also commence the territories of the Emperor of Sindhya and India, who was at this time Muhammad Shah. From this place also is the description of persons arriving, sent in writing to the Emir of Sindhya to Multan. Their Emir at this time was one of the Mamluks of the Sultan Muhammad Sartis Shah, i.e. Sharphead by name, who reviews the armies of the Emperor. I next proceeded to the city of Janai, in which is a people called El Samira. They never eat with strangers, nor are seen eating by them, nor do they contract affinities, or suffer anyone to contract affinities with them. It was here I met the Sheikh El Sali El Abed, the religious Boha Odin El Korashi, see page 7, one of the three, of whom the Sheikh El Wali Borhan Odin El Ahraj said in Alexandria that I should meet them in my travels, and I certainly did meet them, may God be praised. I then proceeded to the city of Sevastan, which is large. Without it is a desert, and in this is there no tree except the Egyptian thorn. Nor do they sow anything on the banks of its river except the melon. They generally live upon a sort of millet, peas, fish, and milk of the buffalo, for the buffalo is here in great abundance. The place is exceedingly hot. From Multan, the capital of Sindhya, is at a distance of ten days. But from Multan to Delhi, the residence of the emperor of Hindustan, is a distance of fifty, which, however, will be traversed by the courier with his dispatches in five there are in hindustan two kinds of couriers horse and foot these they generally term el wolek the horse courier which is part of the sultan's cavalry is stationed at the distance of every four miles as to the foot couriers there will be one at the distance of every mile occupying three consecutive stations which they term el dava and making in the whole three miles, so that there is, at the distance of every three miles, an inhabited village, and without this, three sentry boxes in which the couriers sit, prepared for motion, with their loins girded. In the hand of each is a whip, about two cubits long, and upon the head of this are small bells. Whenever, therefore, one of the couriers leaves any city, he takes his dispatches in the one hand and the whip which he constantly keeps shaking in the other. In this manner he proceeds to the nearest foot courier, and, as he approaches, he shakes his whip. Upon this out comes another, who takes the dispatches and so proceeds to the next. For this reason it is that the sultan receives his dispatches in so short of time. In Sivastan, I met the aged Sheikh Mohammed of Baghdad, who told me that his age was then 140 years, and that he was present when the Caliph el Mostasem was killed by the Tatars in the environs of Baghdad. I then proceeded by the Sindh to the city of Lehari, which is situated upon the shores of the Indian Sea, where the Sindh joins it.
It has a large harbor into which ships from Persia, Yemen, and other places put. At the distance of a few miles from this city are the ruins of another, in which stones in the shape of men and beasts almost innumerable are to be found. The people of this place think that it is the opinion of their historians that there was a city formerly in this place, the greater part of the inhabitants of which were so base that God transformed them, their beasts, their herbs, even to the very seeds, into stones, and indeed stones in the shape of seeds are here almost innumerable. I next proceeded to Bekar which is a handsome city, divided by an arm of the river Sind. Here I met the religious and pious sheikh Shams Odin Muhammad of Shiraz. This was one of the men remarkable for age. He told me that he was something more than 120 years old. I then proceeded on to the city of Uja, which is a large city situated on the Sind. The governing emir at the time of my arrival was El Malik El Fazil El Sharif Jaal Odin El Kabji, a very brave and generous prince. Between myself and him a friendship arose and was confirmed. After this we met in Delhi. I next traveled on to Multan, which is the principal city of Sindia, before the emir of which the sultan's soldiers are obliged to appear. This emir had always before him a number of bows of various sizes, and when anyone who wished to enlist as a bowman presented himself, the emir threw one of these bows to him, which he drew with all his might. Then, as his strength proved to be, so was his situation appointed. But when anyone wished to enlist as a horseman, a drum was fixed, and the man ran with his horse at full speed and struck the drum with his spear. Then, according to the effect of the stroke, was his place determined. There were many persons, emirs, nobles, and learned men, who came to this place before us and with us, all intending to be presented to the emperor. After a few days, therefore, one of the chamberlains of the sultan arrived here in order to conduct these persons to the presence. We then hasted on to Delhi, between which and Multan there is a distance of forty days, throughout which, however, are many contiguous houses, and at these we were honored by being invited every morning and evening to feast, prepared by those who came out to meet, such as were proceeding to be presented to the emperor. The first city we entered, belonging to Hindustan, was Abuhar, which is the first Indian city in this direction. It is small and closely built, and abounds with water and plantations. There are not in Hindustan any of the trees peculiar to our country, if we except the lot tree, which, however, is larger in the trunk than it is with us and its seeds are like those of a great gall apple exceedingly sweet they have likewise large trees not known among us of their fruit trees the grape is one which resembles the orange tree except that its stem is larger and its leaves more numerous its shade too is extensive and very dense and is apt to affect with fever those who sleep under it the fruit is about the size of a large damask prune, which, when green and not quite ripe, they take, of those which happen to fall with salt and thus preserve them, just as the lemon is preserved with us. In the same manner they preserve the ginger while green, as also the pods of pepper, and this they eat with their meals. When the grape is ripe, which is in the autumn, its seeds become yellow, and this they eat like the apple. It is sweet, but during mastication acquires some acidity. It has rather a large stone, which they sow like the orange seed, and from this a tree grows up. Of their fruits are those termed the shaki and barki, the trees of which are high, and their leaves are like the jaws, or Indian nut. The fruit grows out from the bottom of the tree, and that which grows nearest to the earth is called the barki. It is extremely sweet and well-flavored in taste. What grows above this is the shaki. Its fruit resembles that of the great gourd, its rind the skin of an ox, leather. When it grows yellow in the autumn, they gather and divide it, and in the inside of each is from one to two hundred seeds. 
Its seed resembles that of a cucumber and has a stone something like a large bean. When the stone is roasted, it tastes like a dried bean. These, i.e. the shaki and barki, are the best fruits found in Hindustan. They have another sort of fruit, which they call el tand. This is the fruit of the pipercula. Its seed is the size of that of an Armenian peach, to which its color may also be compared. It is exceedingly sweet. They also have the jumun, which is a high tree. The fruit resembles that of the olive and is black, as does likewise its stone. They have also the sweet orange in great abundance, but the acid orange is more esteemed. They also have one between the sweet and sour, which is exceedingly good. They have, too, the fruit called the mahwa. The tree is tall and the leaves are like those of the jaws, except that there is a mixture of yellow and red in them. The fruit resembles the small prune and is very sweet. Upon the head of each of its berries is a small seed, not unlike the grape, both in shape and taste, but they who eat it generally experience the headache. When dried in the sun, its taste is like that of the fig. This berry they call el angur, the grape, however, is seldom found in Hindustan, and then only in Delhi and a few other places. It produces fruit twice in the year. The fig is not found in Hindustan. They also have a fruit which they call kosaf, which is round and very sweet. About the tree they dig and heap the earth, just as they do about the chestnut. They also have in India fruit common with us, which is the pomegranate, and which bears fruit twice in the year. The grain, which they sow for subsistence, is sown twice in the year, and that which is for the autumn, about midsummer when the rains fall, which they reap in sixty days from the time of sowing it. Of this grain, one is termed the kadru, which is a sort of millet. This is the most plentiful grain in use among them and of it are the kal and the shamach, the latter of which is smaller than a bean. The shamach, however, often grows without culture and is the food of the religious, the abstemious, the fakirs, and the poor generally, who go out and gather what thus grows spontaneously and live upon it the year round. When this is beaten in a wooden mortar, the rind falls off and then the kernel, which is white, comes out. This they boil in the milk of the buffalo and make it into a stew, which is much better than when baked. Of their grain, one is the mash, which is a sort of pea, and of this the munjam is a species. The seed is oblong and of a clear green color. This they cook with rice and then eat it with oil. It is called el koshira and taken daily for breakfast. Another species of this is the lubia and another the mohrut, which resembles the kudru, except that its seed is smaller and is used for fodder for cattle. It is pulse. They also feed the beasts with the leaves of the mash instead of green corn. All these are their autumnal grains, and when they cut these they sow the spring grain, which consists of wheat, barley, lentils, and pulse, on the ground from which the autumnal grain had been gathered. The soil of the country is exceedingly good. As to the rice, they sow it three times during the year on the same ground. It is much in use among them. The sesame and sugar cane they cultivate along with the autumnal grain. I at length left the town of Abuhar and proceeded for one day through a desert enclosed on both sides by mountains upon which were infidel and rebel Hindus. The inhabitants of India are in general infidels. Some of them live under the protection of the Mohammedans and reside either in the villages or cities. Others, however, infest the mountains and rob by the highways. I happened to be of a party of two and twenty men when a number of these Hindus, consisting of two horsemen and eighty foot, made an attack upon us. We, however, engaged them, and by God's help put them to flight, having killed one horseman and twelve of the foot. After this we arrived at a fortress, and proceeding on from it, came at length to the city of Adjudhan, which is small. Here I met the holy sheikh, Farid Odin el-Badhawandi, 
of whom the sheik el wali borhan odin el araj had spoken to me in the port of alexandria telling me that i should meet him i therefore did meet him and presented him with the sheik's salutation which surprised him he said i am unworthy of this the sheik was very much broken by the temptations of the devil he allowed no one to touch his hand or to approach him and whenever the clothes of any one happened to touch his he washed them immediately his patronymic is referred to Badhawand, a town of El Sambal. In this part I also saw those women who burn themselves when their husbands die. The woman adorns herself and is accompanied by a cavalcade of the infidel Hindus and Brahmins, with drums, trumpets, and men following her, both Muslims and infidels for mere pastime. The fire had already been kindled, and into it they threw the dead husband. The wife then threw herself upon him, and both were entirely burnt. A woman's burning herself, however, with her husband, is not considered as absolutely necessary among them, but it is encouraged, and when a woman burns herself with her husband, her family is considered as being ennobled and supposed to be worthy of trust. But when she does not burn herself, she is ever after clothed coarsely, and remains in constraint among her relations on account of her want of fidelity to her husband. The woman who burns herself with her husband is generally surrounded by women who bid her farewell and commission her with salutations for their former friends, while she laughs, plays, or dances to the very time in which she is to be burnt. Some of the Hindus, moreover, drown themselves in the river Ganges, to which they perform pilgrimages, and into which they pour the ashes of those who have been burnt. When any one intends to drown himself, he opens his mind on the subject to one of his companions and says, You are not to suppose that I do this for the sake of anything worldly. My only motive is to draw near to Kisai, which is a name of God with them and when he is drowned they draw him out of the water, burn the body, and pour the ashes into the Ganges. After four days' journey I arrived at the city of Sarsati. It is large and abounds with rice, which they carry hence to Delhi, and after this at Hansi, which is a very beautiful and closely built city, with extensive fortifications. I next came to Masud Abad after two days' travelling, and remained there three days. The Emperor Muhammad, whom it was our object to see, had at this time left his residence in Delhi and gone to Kinoji, which is at the distance of ten days from that place. He sent his vizier, however, Kaja Jahan Ahmed ibn Ayas, a native of Rum, with a number of kings, doctors, and grandees, to receive the travellers, and Emir is with them termed king. The vizier then so arranged the procession that each one had a place according to his rank. We then proceeded on from Masud Abad till we came to Delhi, the capital of the empire. It is a most magnificent city, combining at once both beauty and strength. Its walls are such as to have no equal in the whole world. This is the greatest city of Hindustan, and indeed of all Islamism in the East. It now consists of four cities, which becoming continuous have formed one. This city was conquered in the year of the Hejira, 584 A.D., 1188. The thickness of its walls is eleven cubits. They keep grain in this city for a very long time without its undergoing any change whatever. I myself saw rice brought out of the treasury, which was quite black, but nevertheless had lost none of the goodness of its taste. The same was the case with the kadru, which had been in the treasury for ninety years. Flowers, too, are in continual blossom in this place. Its mosque is very large, and, in the beauty and extent of its building, it has no equal." Before the taking of Delhi, it had been a Hindu temple, which the Hindus called el bur Khana, but Khana. But after that event, it was used as a mosque. In its courtyard is a cell, to which there is no equal in the cities of the Mohammedans. Its height is such that men appear from the top of it like little children. In its court, too, there is an immense pillar, which they say is composed of stones from seven different quarries. Its length is thirty cubits, its circumference eight, which is truly miraculous. 
Without, the city is a reservoir for the rainwater, and out of this the inhabitants have their water for drinking. It is two miles in length and one in width. About it are pleasure gardens to which the people resort, the nobles of the city. Chapter 15 Conquest of Delhi, Abstract of the History of Hindustan, From This Time to That, in which Ibn Battuta visited this place. The city of Delhi was conquered by the emir Khatbi Odan Abak, one of the Mamluks of the Sultan, Shahab Odin Muhammad ibn Sam al Ghori, king of Gizna and Khorasan, who had overcome Ibrahim ibn Mahmud ibn Subuktajin, the beginner of the conquest of India. This emir, Khatib Odin, resided here as governor on the part of Shabab Odin. But when Kotbi Odin died, his son, Shams Odin Lahmish, became governor. After this, Shams Odin became possessed of the kingdom here, having been appointed thereto by the general consent of the people, and he governed India for twenty years. He was a just, learned, and religious prince. After his death, his son Rokin Odin took possession of the throne, but polluted his reign by killing his brothers and was therefore killed himself. Upon this, the army agreed to place his sister El Malika Razia upon the throne, who reigned four years. This woman usually rode about among the army, just as men do. She, however, gave up the government on account of some circumstances that presented themselves. After this, her younger brother, Nasir Odin, became possessed of the government which he held for twenty years, this was a very religious prince, and so much so that he lived entirely on what he got by writing out and selling copies of the Koran. He was succeeded by his Nawab, Giyath Odin Ahmed, one of his father's Mamluks, who murdered him. This man's name was originally Balaban. His character had been just, discriminating, and mild. He filled the office of Nawab of India under Nasir Odin for twenty years. He also reigned twenty years. One of his pious acts was his building a house which was called the House of Safety, for whenever any debtor entered this, his debt was adjudged, and in like manner every oppressed person found justice, every manslayer deliverance from his adversary, and every person in fear protection. When he died, he was buried in this house, and there I myself visited his grave. The history of his beginnings is surprising, which is this. When a child, he lived in Bokhara, in the possession of one of the inhabitants, and was a little despicable, ill-looking wretch. Upon a time, a certain fakir saw him there and said, You little Turk, which is considered by them as a very reproachful term. The reply was, I am here, good sir. This surprised the fakir, who said to him, Go and bring me one of those pomegranates, pointing to some which had been exposed for sale in the street. The urchin replied, Yes, sir, and immediately taking out all the money he had, went and bought the pomegranate. When the fakir received it, he said to Balaban, We give you the kingdom of India, upon which the boy kissed his own hand and said, I have accepted of it and am quite satisfied. It happened about this time that the Sultan Shams Odin sent a merchant to purchase slaves from Bokhara and Samarkand. He accordingly bought a hundred, and Balaban was among them. When these Mamluks were brought before the Sultan, they all pleased him except Balaban, and him he rejected on account of his despicable appearance. Upon this, Balaban said to the emperor, Lord of the world, why have you bought all these slaves? The emperor smiled and said, For my own sake, no doubt. The slave replied, By me then, for God's sake. I will, said he. He then accepted of him and placed him among the rest, but, on account of the badness of his appearance, gave him a situation among the cup-bearers. Some of the astrologers who were about the king were daily in the habit of saying to him, One of the Mamluks will one day overcome thy son and take the kingdom from him. 
to this the emperor on account of the justice and excellency of his own character paid no regard till they also told it to the queen mother who soon made an impression on his mind respecting it he accordingly summoned the astrologers before him and said pray can you tell which of the mamluks it is who is to take the kingdom from my son if you see him they said we have a mark whereby we can distinguish him the emperor then ordered all the mamluks to be present who came accordingly station after station as commanded upon these the astrologers fixed their eyes but did not discover the person looked for until the day began to draw towards the close at this time the cup-bearer said one to another we are getting rather hungry let us join and send someone into the street to buy us something to eat they did so and balaban as the most despicable was sent to make the purchase balaban accordingly sallied forth but could find nothing in that street which would suit him he then went on into another during which time the turn of the cup-bearers came on to be presented but as balaban was not forthcoming they took a little pitch and whatever else was necessary for their purpose and daubing it over a child took him with them in the place of balaban and when his name was called over this child was presented and the business of the day was closed without the astrologers finding their mark upon any one which was a providential circumstance for balaban at last balaban made his appearance but not till the business of the day was over the cleverness of balaban was afterwards noticed and he was made head of the cup-bearers after this he was placed in the army and soon became a general officer after this the sultan jalal odin married his daughter which was before he had been made king but when he was he appointed balaban to the office of nawab or viceroy which he filled for twenty years he then killed his master and seized the empire this balaban had two sons one of these namely el khan el shahid he appointed as his own successor and governor on his part in the provinces of scindia he resided at multan he was killed however in an affair with the tartars leaving two sons kegobad and kekosru balaban's second son named nasir odin was appointed to govern the districts of Lakhnuti and Bengal. When, however, the heir apparent El Khan El Shahid had been killed, Balaban appointed El Khan El Shahid's son Kekasru his successor, passing over his own son Nasir Odan. Nasir Odan, however, had a son named Moise Odan, residing at the court of his grandfather at Delhi, the person who eventually became successor to Balaban. This at length came to pass on account of Giath Odem Balaban's dying in the night, when his own son Nasir Odem was out of the way in the district of Lakhnuti. On this occasion he appointed Kakhosru his grandson, the son of El Khan El Shahid, as already mentioned. The king, however, or chief of the emirs and Nawab to the Sultan Balaban, happened to have conceived a strong enmity against Kakhosru. On this account he had recourse to a stratagem, which gained him his end. It was this. He forged a letter in the name of the emirs, stating that they had declared Moise Odan, son of Nasir Odan, king. With this he goes to Kakasuru by night, as if wishing to advise with him, and says, The emirs have proclaimed thy uncle's son, and I very much fear for thy safety. The reply was, What am I to do? He said, Save thyself by escaping to the districts of Scindia. But, replied he, how am I to get through the gates of the city which are already barred? The keys, answered the emir, are here in my possession. I will open the gates for you. The young man thanked him for this and then kissed his hand. The emir said, Mount immediately. He accordingly did, with his nobles and slaves, and the emir opened the gates, let them out, and immediately closed them again. He next went to Moise Odin, son of Nasir Odin, and asked permission to enter, which, being granted, he proclaimed him emperor. But how is this, replied Moise Odin, since Kakhosru, my uncle's son, was appointed successor? 
The emir told him of his stratagem and how he had got rid of Kekhosru. Moïse Odin thanked him for this and then took him to the palace, where, sending for the rest of the emirs and nobles, they invested him with the supreme authority during the night. In the morning this was confirmed by the people generally, and Moïse Odin took possession of the throne. His father, however, was living at this time in the provinces of Benga and Laknuti, and when the news of his son's being made emperor reached him, he said, I am heir to the crown. How, then, can my son exercise this authority during my lifetime? He accordingly set out with his army for Delhi in order to make war upon his son Moïse Odin. Moïse Odin, too, marched out with his troops to give battle to his father. They both arrived at the same time at the city of Kara, which is situated on the banks of the Ganges, took their stations on opposite sides of the river, and prepared for the onset. It was the will of divine providence, however, to spare the blood of the faithful, and hence the heart of the father, Nasir Odin, began to relent towards his son, for he said to himself, Surely as long as my son is king, I shall partake of his glory. Moiz Odin, too, felt in his mind that something of submission was due to his father. Each of them, therefore, as if by instinct, left his army and rode directly into the middle of the river and met there. Here the emperor kissed the feet of his father and asked his forgiveness. His father replied, I give you my kingdom, and so invested him with the authority of emperor. He then wished to retire to his districts, but his son said, Nay, you must come with me to mine. He accordingly accompanied him to Delhi, and entering the palace, seated his son upon the throne, and took his own station before him. This day is therefore called the day of meeting, because they had this happy rencontre in the middle of the river, no blood being shed, and the kingdom mutually given and accepted. After this, Nasir Odin returned to his districts, where, after two years, he died, leaving a family behind him. The kingdom was thus confirmed to Moïse Odin, which continued for four years, during which the inhabitants may be said to have enjoyed a continual holiday. After this he was affected by a complaint, by which one of his sides became quite withered, and for which the physicians could find no remedy. At this time his nawab Jalal Odin Feroz Shah el Kilaji revolted, taking his station upon a high mount without the city. Moïse Odin sent his emirs for the purpose of giving him battle, but they all, one after another, joined him, and proclaimed him emperor. Jalal Odin then entered the city, and enclosing Moïse Odin within his palace for three days, overcame him, put him to death, and took possession of his kingdom. This Jalal Odin was a mild and well-informed prince. He governed India for two years. He had a son and a daughter. The daughter he married to his brother's son, Allah Odin, a daring, bold, and powerful man. His wife, however, so much harassed him that he was obliged to complain to her father in order to have an end put to their disputes. The uncle had given him the government of Kara and Manikbur, containing two of the most populous districts in India. Allah Odan, however, had an eye to the kingdom. The only difficulty he had to contend with was his want of money, for he had none, except what he got by his sword in making new conquests. Upon one of these expeditions his horse happened to stumble against a stone as he went along, and from this a kind of ringing noise proceeded. He immediately ordered his men to dig, and here they found an immense quantity of wealth. This he divided among his followers, and hence acquired considerable power. It happened that his uncle undertook an expedition against him, and summoned him before him, but he refused to appear. The uncle then prepared to go to him, for he said, This young man is as my son, I will therefore go to him. The nephew accordingly met him, which happened upon the banks of the Ganges, in the very place where Moïse Odin and Nasir Odin had formerly met, and like them each rode into the middle of the river. 
Allah Odin, however, had commanded his followers that at the time he should embrace his uncle Jalal Odin, they were to kill him. When therefore the parties met, and the nephew was in the act of embracing the uncle, the followers of the nephew killed him, which put Allah Odin in possession of his uncle's army, and all proclaimed him emperor. After this he governed Hindustan for twenty years. He was just, and looked to the affairs of his subjects in person. Now he also had a nephew named Soliman Shah, and as he was one day engaged in the chase, this nephew conceived the intention of destroying him, just as he had of destroying his own uncle. He shot him accordingly with an arrow in an unguarded moment, and the uncle fell from his horse. The nephew was about to make up to him when he was told by his slave that he need not do so, as he was quite dead. He left him, therefore, and returned to the palace and took possession of the government. A little while after Allah Odin, recovering from his stupor, got up and mounted a horse which the army perceiving joined him. He then entered the city and besieged his nephew, Solomon Shah, in the palace, who, feeling his weakness, betook himself to flight but was taken and put to death by his uncle Allah Odin. After this he never rode a hunting to divine service or to the celebration of any public holiday. He had five sons, the younger of whom were Shahab Odin and Kotbi Odin, the eldest he had during his lifetime ordered to be kept in prison. When taken with his last sickness, the anger of the young man on account of his imprisonment not having abated, and when the disease was making rapid advances, he sent for this son in order to name him as his successor. But, he delaying to come in consequence of this irritation, the Mamluks, the head of whom hated this son, together with the principal Nuab, placed the younger son Shahab Odan upon the throne, as soon as the emperor was dead, and the appointment was confirmed by the people. The three elder children, however, were ordered to be imprisoned and their eyes to be put out, and thus was the government established. Upon this, the queen sent for two of the most powerful of her husband's Mamluks, the name of one of whom was Bashir, that of the other Mubashir, and with tears complained of the conduct of the principal Nuab towards her children, soliciting their assistance and stimulating them to put the chief Nuab to death and affirming that it was his intention to murder her younger son Kotbi Odan. They accordingly agreed to kill him, which they did by stratagem while he was in his house. They then brought forth Kotbi Odan to his brother Shahab Odan, who held the reins of government. Kotbi Odan remained for some time in the situation of his Nuab, but at length deposed his brother and took possession of the kingdom, which he held for some time. After this, he took a journey to Daulat Abad, between which and Delhi is a distance of forty days. The road is from first to last enclosed with willow and other trees, so that a traveller seems to be in a garden throughout all this distance. Besides, there are at the distance of every three miles the stations of the foot couriers, at which there are also inhabitants as already mentioned. From this place to El Telangana and El Mabar is a distance of six months. In all these stations there is a lodging for the emperor, with cells for his suite and for travellers generally. There is no necessity, therefore, for a poor man's carrying any provisions with him on this road. When, therefore, the Sultan Kotbi Odan was on this journey and had with him Kazir Khan, the son of his elder brother who was in prison, some of the emirs formed a conspiracy by which it was their intention to depose the emperor and to proclaim this son of his elder brother. But the emperor, discovering this, instantly put his nephew and his nephew's father to death, as well as his other brothers, who were then confined in the fortress of Caliur. This fortress is situated on the top of a high hill, and seems as if it had been cut out of the rock. Opposite to it is no other mount. Within it are reservoirs filled with rainwater, and about it are numerous walls, upon which warlike engines are planted. This is their strongest fortress. Beneath it is a small town. 
when however kotbi oden had killed his brothers and so purified his kingdom that no one seemed left to contend with him divine providence gave the supreme power to one of his most powerful and choice friends namely nasir oden kosru khan who killed him and took possession of the empire but this he held only for a short time the reason was that when he had taken possession of the throne he sent dresses of honor to the governors of the several provinces which they all put on as a mark of obedience if we except toglik shah father of the present emperor of hindustan mohammed shah this person was then governor of dibalbur and would neither put on the dress nor tender his obedience the consequence was an army was sent against him which he put to flight. The emperor then sent his brother against him. Him also he routed and put to death, and so far did matters proceed that Togluk also slew Nasir Odin Khosru Khan and seized his empire. This Nasir Odin had originated some great abominations during his reign, of which the forbidding oxen to be slaughtered is one, and which is one of the regulations of the infidel Hindus, for among them no one is allowed to slaughter an ox, and in case he should do so, he is ordered to be stitched up in its skin and be burnt. The reason is, they so much esteem the ox that they drink its urine, both to promote prosperity and to recover health. They also daub their walls with the dung of these animals. Hence it was that Nasir Odan became so hateful to the Mohammedans that they stimulated Toglik Giath Odan to put him to death and to take possession of the kingdom. This Toglik was originally descended from the Turks who inhabit the mountains in the district of Sindia. He was very poor, but betaking himself to the cities of these parts, he got employment in feeding cattle. After this he became a foot soldier, and then a horse soldier. In the next place, as his abilities appeared, he was made a commanding officer. After this, the emperor Kotbi Odan appointed him governor of Dibalbur, and his son, who is now emperor, keeper of the horse. Toglik was brave, warlike, honorable, and just, and, as his son was stationed at Delhi as keeper of the horse, when the father had determined to rebel, he corresponded with this son, who cajoled the emperor Khosru Khan, sometimes, for example, appearing at his post without the city, and then returning to his father. After some days, however, he was missing till after sunset, which, giving some suspicion to Nasir Odan, he sent for him but could not find him. On this occasion he had escaped and taken all the best of the emperor's horses to his father. Chapter 15 The emir of Multan, Kashlukan, joined Togluk in his rebellion in order to avenge Kotbi Odan, son of Nasir Odan, their common master. When, however, the two conspirators entered Delhi, and Nasir Odan had betaken himself to flight with only a few Hindu fakirs, Togluk said to Kashlukan, You shall be emperor. But he refused, and Togluk took possession of the government. After this, Nasir Odan was taken and put to death, and the kingdom was purged and remained so for four years. After this, the emperor sent his son, who is now emperor, to reduce the provinces of Telinga, which are at the distance of three months from Delhi. But when he had arrived at a certain part of the way, one of the courtiers thought proper to rebel, and to possess himself, if possible, of the kingdom. For this purpose he circulated a report that the emperor was dead, supposing that the emirs would now immediately proclaim him king. When they heard this, however, every one of them struck his drum and betook himself to his own part, i.e. to rebellion, so that the prince was left with his particular friends alone. The emirs, moreover, intended to kill him, but from this they were diverted by one of the great men of their body, whose name was Timur. The prince then fled to his father with ten of his friends, whom he styled Yeran, i.e. friends in the Persic. But when he came to him, was immediately sent back on his journey with a large army. Upon this the emirs, who had intended to put him to death, fled, but some of them were taken and put to death. 
Thus the matter terminated, and he returned to his father. The father himself then undertook an expedition against the province of Laknuti, in which resided at that time the Sultan Shams Oden, son of Giath Oden Balaban, to whom had fled the emirs of Toglik, as just mentioned. About this time, however, Shams Oden died, having first bound his son Shahab Oden by contract, who accordingly took possession of the throne. His younger brother, however, Gath Oden Bahadur Bura, overcame him and seized upon the kingdom. He then killed all the rest of his brothers except Shahab Oden, who had been bound to mount the throne, and Nasir Oden, for they fled to Toglik, imploring assistance. He allowed them, therefore, to march with his army in order to give battle to Giath Oden. Toglik had also appointed his son Mohammed to the office of Nuab in Delhi during his own absence on this expedition. He proceeded, therefore, and gained possession of the province of Laknuti, having put Gath Odan to the rout, after which, however, he took him prisoner and carried him to Delhi. When he had got near to Delhi, he sent to his son Mohammed, requesting him to build him a kushka, that is, a palace, which he did, and constructed one well made of wood in the space of three days. But Mohammed the son made an agreement with the geometrician who planned it, that the steps leading to it should be made sufficiently broad to allow the elephants to ascend them, in order to their being presented to the Emperor Toglik. A place also was so constructed that when the foot of the elephant should come in contact with it, the whole palace should fall down upon all who may happen to be in it. When, therefore, the emperor arrived at his palace, he had it carpeted and furnished, and took up his residence within it. Now the emperor had a second son, who was a favorite with him. In consequence of this, the elder brother Mohammed very much feared lest he should be appointed successor to the throne. When, therefore, the different orders, as well as those who had come to welcome the sultan, had concluded the banquet, the elephants were presented before him. But when the elephant's foot came in contact with the place appointed, down came the palace upon the head of the sultan Toglik, his favorite son, and the courtiers who were assembled before him, and all perished. Muhammad, the present emperor, accordingly took possession of the throne, having been proclaimed by the emirs and people, and thus was the kingdom purged of his enemies. Appendix An abstract of the history of the fortress of Gwalior, from the Gwalior Nama of Heraman ibn Kardar das de Munchi. As this fortress is one of the greatest curiosities in Hindustan, I may perhaps be excused in giving some extracts from a book entitled The Gwalior Nama, respecting its history and governors. The hill, it is said, was originally called Kumatat, and that its neighborhood abounded in wild beasts. Upon the hill a devotee named Gawalipa made his residence just thirty-two years before the reign of Bikramajit. Some time after this a zamindar named Suraj Sin, happening to come to this place while engaged in the chase, applied to the devotee for water to drink, which was granted. Upon this and some other occasions, the powers of these waters turned out to be so wonderfully beneficial that the zemindar requested to be permitted to enlarge the well and to build a fortress on the hill, which was also granted. The darvesh, after blessing the zemindar and giving him a casket, which had the supernatural property of supplying him with gold, gave him the name of Suraj Pal, adding that as long as his descendants retained the name of Pal, so long would they hold this fortress, and succeed in reducing their neighbors to their obedience. The consequence of which was, this zemindar and his posterity became the proprietors of all the neighboring country, and after him the well Suraj Kund received its name. After this king, eighty-four of his posterity reigned in the fortress of Gwalior, the fourth of whom, Bimpal, built the pagoda called Bim Absar. The seventh, Bujpal, built the pagoda called Chatar Buj Rey at the top of the fortress. The eighth, Padampal, built the pagoda of Lakshmi Narayan. The ninth, Anangpal, skilled, as it should seem, in the chemical art, struck golden ashrafs of five tola in weight. 
Nothing remarkable is recorded of the rest until we come to the last, who received the name of Yatash Karan, and who, conformable with the prophecy of the Hindu sage, lost the government of the fort, together with that of the adjacent countries. The account of this event is shortly this. A neighboring Raja named Ran Mal had no son and only one daughter. This prince, therefore, of the Pal family offered himself as her suitor and was accepted. Before he could return to Gwalior, he was adopted son and successor to the Raja Ran Mal, and as this Raja's dominions were greater than his own, he was easily persuaded by his viceroy Ram Deo, whom he had left at Gwalior, to make over the government of the country and fortress to him. Seven of Ram Deo's successors held the fortress accordingly, until the time of the Sultan Shams Odan, who was originally a slave of Turkish extraction, belonging to the Sultan Kotbi Odan e Pak. This king, when returning from an expedition to the Deccan, saw for the first time this singularly strong fortress, and upon finding that none of its governors had paid tribute to the emperors of Delhi, swore upon the Koran that he would subdue it, which he soon after accomplished. Upon this occasion, which happened A.H. 630, A.D. 1232, a mosque was erected in the fort, and prayers offered up in the name of the sultan. Some time after, the sultan surveying the place found that it contained only two wells of water, and that the part at which he had entered was rather weak. He ordered a wall, therefore, to be built, joining it to the hill, and in the area he made eight wells and nine badries, all of which are still in being. One of these wells is very famous for its waters, which are carried to a great distance and are found very useful to invalids. After the sultan had made all his arrangements, he returned to Delhi, leaving the fortress in the hands of one Bahadur Khan. From this time to that of the sultan Allah Odam, no officer had been sent from Delhi to Gwalior. Some time after his accession, however, it was given to two Rajputs of the Purgana of Dandaruli as a reward for faithful service. These men, however, being much envied by their neighbors, the Rajputs of Tunur were at length invited to a feast at a little distance from the fortress and killed by treachery. The fortress then fell into their hands, and eight persons of that tribe held it in succession. Several wells, pagodas, and bowers were made by this race, the last of whom was Bikramajit. The fortress then reverted to the Muslims. From this time to the reign of Ibrahim, grandson of the Sultan Balul Ludi, the fortress was held by Bikramajit upon paying tribute to the kings of Delhi. Ibrahim, however, forced the power, not without considerable loss, out of the hands of Bikramajit, who, being sent to the presence a prisoner, received the Jagir of Shams Abad, the government of the fortress then fell into the hands of Azam Humayun, Ibrahim's general. Some time after this, Ibrahim, suspecting the fidelity of his nobles, and thinking it particularly dangerous to retain Azam Humayun, who had a large and powerful circle of friends, had him suddenly put to death, upon which Salim Khan, son of the murdered general, rebelled, and betook himself to the east of Hindustan, but was taken and put to death by Darya Khan, who had been appointed governor of the province of Bihar. Soon after, the Ludi family fled to the Punjab and presented themselves and their services to Zahir Odan Mohammed Baber in Kabul. Here they represented the perturbed state of Hindustan and formed a treaty with him, which ended in its final subjugation, for soon after a battle took place in which Ibrahim was slain, with Bikramajit fighting at his side. Kajarahim Dad, one of Baber's servants, was now appointed to the government of Gwalior, but in a little time got out of favor when a Rajput named Dahar Mankad, a zamindar of that quarter, became governor of the fortress. 
Upon this occasion, Sheikh Mohammed Goth, a man of considerable influence, represented to the king the great impropriety of an infidel's holding this fortress, under a sovereign who professed the true faith, and Kaja Rahim Dad was restored to the government, which he held but a short time, and was succeeded by Abul Fath, who held it till the death of Baber. When Mohammed Humayun succeeded to the throne, he took up his residence for some time in the fortress of Gwalior, and at that time built the Humayun Temple, a place commanding an extensive prospect and enjoying the most wholesome air. He then returned to his capital. When Shir Shah came to the throne, he took up his residence for some time at Gwalior, and then built the Sher Temple, and also constructed a large tank in its area. After the death of Shir Shah, which happened at this place, his son Jalal Khan succeeded to the throne, and took the name of Islam Shah. He also took up his residence in this fortress, and in it he died. During the next reign, which was short and troublous, the possession of the fort of Gwalior remained in the hands of Barbal, a slave of Shir Shah, who held it until Akbar came to the throne. The Rajputs, however, desirous of regaining their ancient ascendancy in these parts, with Ramsa, a son of Bikramajit, assembled a large force and attacked the fortress. Upon this occasion, Kaya Khan, one of Akbar's generals, was dispatched to relieve and take possession of it. When Kaya arrived at Gwalior, he was met by the forces of Ramsa, and an obstinate battle of three days' continuance ensued, but which ended in favor of Akbar's troops. After this, Bahbal remained to be subdued, and the fort to be taken, which, after a short siege, was completed. The servants of Akbar held the fortress after this for fifty years. When Jahangir came to the throne, the government of Gwalior was put into the hands of his servants, who seemed to have advised him to destroy the building termed the Shir Mandar, to erect another in its place, and to name it the Jahangir Mandar, which is said to be very beautiful. When Shah Jahan succeeded to the empire, the government of Gwalior fell to the lot of one of his greatest favorites and bravest generals, Muzaffir Khan, who on this occasion received the title of Walakani Jahan, and in his hands it remained during a space of nineteen years. This governor was a great encourager of good and learned men, and very remarkable for his justice and liberality to all. He is said to have had an elephant so powerful and courageous that he would destroy whole ranks of the enemy at once, which he did so effectually upon a battle happening with the house of Ludi, that he was the principal cause of the victory, and for which the governor obtained the title of Kani Jahan. On this and other accounts, he had a statue of this elephant carved in stone, and set up at the north gate of the fort. Near the same spot he erected and peopled a village, and this he called, after his former name, Muzaffir Pur. In the vicinity of this he planted a garden, and here he made two wells, and erected some seats for the accommodation of the inhabitants. A few trees of this garden still remain. Besides this, he built a lofty mansion for himself, containing some large rooms of state, with other apartments, in the court of which he made a deep tank, and in the front of this court four gardens. In this mansion the governors of the fort still reside. It is also said that during this man's government his son Mansur planted a garden on the banks of the river Sunrig, which he called after his own name, and which still is used as a promenade for the town. He built, too, four walls of stone, in the middle of which seats were constructed. He also built and peopled the village Mansurpur, which he called after his own name, and this still remains. After the expiration of nineteen years, Kani Jahan took a journey to Lahore, and there died. Upon this occasion, Sayyad Salar Khan, who had been his confidential servant, asked for and obtained the government of the fort of Gwalior. 
He then resided in it for two years. After this, his brother governed the fort, and he himself was appointed to the government of the provinces. This brother, named Sayyad Alam, held the fort for five years, during which time he made and beautified a garden near the Sarai of Meher Ali, and in the ground known by the name of Kisurpur. He built and peopled the village Shah Kunj. It is said that at that time the foundations of the gates of the fort called Badal Kada and Hiata Pul had become much decayed, and that he repaired them, covering the gates with iron and so firmly nailing them, that the rush of an elephant would not make the least impression on them. Soon after this he was put out of office for some crime which had better not be mentioned, as our author tells us, and was succeeded by Loharhasp Khan, son of Muhabat Khan, who appointed Karhasp Khan his lieutenant, but after two years took up his residence himself in the fortress. He is said to have been a brave and liberal man, charitable to the poor, and most anxious for information, both from travellers and others. He erected a court of justice without the gate, called Badal Kada, and close to the northern wall of the fort, in which on certain days he administered justice to the people. The kettle drum of royalty, which formerly was placed at the gate, termed Hayatapul, he removed to the east of the fort, and nearer to the city, where it still remains. He commenced the removal of the Shakunj to the east of the fort, but left the work unfinished. He also erected a lofty stateroom in the Arwahi, and made two wells of exceeding good water in its courtyard. After the space of six years, however, he was sent on an expedition into the Deccan, from which he returned with success. He then presented himself before the emperor in Delhi, who appointed him to the government of the Suba of Kabul. Upon this occasion, his governor at Gwalior was a person named Akharaj, an officer in whom he placed great confidence. This happened in A.H. 1067, A.D. 1656. During the sickness of the reigning king, which happened at this time, and the troubles which arose on account of the rebellion of Darashiko and his brothers, we hear scarcely anything of the fortress of Gwalior, because perhaps it happened to lie almost entirely out of the scene of action. It remained, however, for some time in the hands of Akharaj, but as he had the imprudence to close it on one occasion against the royal standard, it was at length given to Obeid Allah Khan, and soon after this several of the rebels falling into the king's power were put into confinement in the fortress and there kept. In the next year, i.e. A.H. 1068, A.D. 1657, Dara Shiko was carried prisoner to Delhi and there lost his life, and upon this his son Sipahar Shiko with several of his friends were all placed in the fortress of Gwalior in the custody of Obeid Allah Khan. The fort was now closely guarded and no stranger permitted to enter it. About this time, a great scarcity took place, probably in consequence of the preceding wars, when Obeid Allah Khan made a provision for the first time for the pious, for travelers, and the poor. This was given in the courthouse built by the former governor, where Mohammed, a sharif, and Mansabdar presided. Soon after, several other of the rebels, namely Mohammed Sultan, Soliman Shiko, and several nobles, their friends, fell into the hands of the emperor, and were consigned to the governor of Gwalior, who now was Mutamid Khan, obeyed Allah, having been commanded to give up the fortress to him. Soliman Shiko, however, soon after died, and Morad Baksh, one of the nobles, was put to death by the law of retaliation. The graves of both are on the top of the fort. The first two years of the government of Muatadid Khan in the fortress of Gwalior were marked with the utmost liberality and regard to public good, particularly so as a great scarcity prevailed during this time. He also erected a lofty hall for the transaction of public business, adjoining the Shah Jahan Mandar, as also a bath, which was a great public convenience. 
a wall too which had long been commenced stretching out before the gate termed badal kada and which had been intended to obstruct a ready egress from the fort was completed by him to which he added another somewhat higher than the gateway and joining the walls of the castle a sixth gateway leading from the fort to the plain was also constructed by him and this received the name alamgir upon both angles of the wall he likewise erected a lofty tower and over the gates of each of those a chateri on the left side of the gate badal kada a large hall of justice was also built in which the business of state was ever after to be transacted from all of which the appearance and strength of the fort were greatly augmented the inscription then written on the alam giri gate was this in the happy times of alamgir from whose bounty time was blessed muatamid khan from his lofty mind opened a door of prosperity upon the face of the fortress hatif said on the year of its date let the place long remain the residence of plenty the sum of the letters according to the abjad found in the last line of these verses will give the date of the hegira in which this event took place which is a h ten seventy one a d sixteen sixty the mandui looking towards the city eastward and commenced by muhabat khan was completed by this governor and called arang kunjabad he also constructed the shops which run in both directions and in which the business of the city and markets is carried on over this place he constructed a high wall which joins the fort and which received the name of the fort the asylum of the city encompassing this is the norikunj abad also erected by him for the reception and support of the pious he also repaired and very much strengthened the court of the Kachari, and, as the inhabitants of this part were very much in want of water, he obtained leave from the court to construct three stone cisterns with seats, gates, and whatever else was necessary to promote the convenience and pleasure of the people, all of which he completed, and the following is the inscription which was placed over one of the gates at this time during the reign of the great prince al-magir from whose justice the world is peopled mustamid khan erected a strong building from the water of which the sick are healed by wisdom says hatif i sought the year of its erection it is a fountain of light i e the sum of the letters in the last four words which is a h ten seventy three a d sixteen sixty two the tank which stood in the way to the fort and was situated near the bahrum pool growing old was by the heavy rains which fell about this time utterly destroyed and the stones of which it had been built were carried to some distance this governor thoroughly repaired it and the idol temple standing near it which had originally belonged to gawali pa and was now much frequented by the hindus he converted into a mosque for the use of strangers and travellers the following is the inscription which was then fixed upon it in the reign of the great prince alamagir like the full shining moon the enlightener of the world praise to god that this happy place was by muatamid khan completed as an alms it was the idol temple of the vile gawali he made it a mosque like a mansion of paradise the khan of enlightened heart nay light itself from head to foot displayed the divine light like that of midday he closed the idol temple exclamations of surprise rose from earth to heaven when the light put far away the abode of darkness darkness hatif said let the light be a blessing nota bene the sum of the letters composing the last three words counted according to the abjad see sir william jones's persian grammar page fourteen edit nine amounts to ten seventy five and this gives the year of the hegira in which this took place a d sixteen sixty four he also repaired and deepened a tank in the grounds called the Kabutar Kana, or Pigeon House, and to this he gave the name of Nuri Sakir.
Another tank, too, situated on the top of the fort, and near the Shah Jahan Mandar, which had grown so much out of repair as to lose its water, notwithstanding its having been cut out of the solid rock, he thoroughly repaired, and enclosed with a wall firmly built with brick and mortar, so that not a drop of its water was lost. To each of these last a copy of verses was attached, giving the date of the repairs and the name of the Khan, which I do not think it worth while to copy out and translate. The same governor, it is said, so adorned and planted the Arwahi, which appeared like a girdle about the mount, that it presented fountains, tanks, a chabutera, grapes, melons, and other fruits, such that many of the fruits were, on account of their superlative excellence, frequently sent to the presence at Delhi. The melons were occasionally so large that some of them exceeded fourteen of the ser of Shah Jahan Abad in weight. Besides this, a mosque was erected in the Chok Bazar with three immensely high towers and some minarets, having also a tank of water with other fountains always filled with water, and surrounded with seats for the convenience of ablution. Before this is an area with a very high gate, on the top of which is a bankla, and on both sides two beautifully constructed halls. Another tank was also made, and named after his son Jamali Sarur, which was surrounded by stone walls and provided with seats. In the year 1078 of the Hejira, A.D. 1667, an order came from the court commanding Mutamid Khan to give up the fort, together with the prisoners it contained, which were then three, to Kidmatgar Khan and to proceed to the presence in order to receive the government of Akberabad. With this the Khan complied and proceeded to Shah Jahanabad, where he was loaded with favors and dismissed to his station. And as the writer of this history, Heraman ibn Qadar Das the Munshi, was a servant of Motamid Khan, his account of Gwalior closes with the removal of his master from that place. End of section six. 